surging coronavirus cases puts the world back on high alert. The Delta variant presents a new threat in the pandemic. The ability to transmit from person to person is much, much greater and more efficient than the prior variants, the alpha variant that we had. Mask mandates return amid an anti-vaccine movement in America and the great need for vaccines elsewhere. 24 countries are in resurgence and deaths are rising in eight countries. This is a preventable tragedy if African countries can get fair access to the vaccines. As hospitals are again pushed to capacity and students go back to school, the challenges of getting more shots into more arms now are the inside story, Vaccine Gap. Hey. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Lee reporting from Washington, D.C. Despite easy access to COVID vaccines, the United States is dealing with a spike in hospitalizations and deaths. Most of the cases are from the most contagious COVID-19 strain so far, the Delta variant. Its spread here and around the world is of utmost concern in the race to make vaccines available to more people, especially as schools open with many children ineligible to be vaccinated. We're going to start with an overview of the COVID situation and how it's trending. Here's VOA's Arash Erbasadi. The CDC is seeing red, and that means nearly every inch of the United States has a high level of transmission of COVID-19. This despite a recent downtick in both the numbers of cases and deaths from the disease. The CDC reports more than 74% of American adults have at least one vaccination. Meanwhile, in Europe, French President Emmanuel Macron's government is on track to deliver 50 million first vaccines in the coming days, bringing to 85 percent the number of people aged 12 and up with at least one shot. That would put France behind only the UAE and Uruguay as the world's top vaccinated countries ahead of Israel, the UK and US. Earlier this week, the European Union recommended reinstating travel restrictions on travelers from the US due to rising infection rates. Finally, in Africa, where health officials continue battling misinformation and distrust, the continent is getting 10 million vaccine doses from France. Shots will be distributed through a partnership between the African Union's AVAT and the World Health Organization's COVAX. All this as kids across the world head back to school with those younger than 12 still unable to be vaccinated. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News. Only about 2% of the population of Africa are fully vaccinated. Getting vaccines to Africa is one challenge. Another is convincing people to take the shot when it's available. One religious group in South Africa is going door to door to help the hesitant overcome their fears. Linda Givchash reports from Johannesburg. Dawn Kratz received her Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine in the comfort of her South Johannesburg home. While a vaccine has been made available to the 64-year-old since April, Kratz says rumors about the side effects made her hesitate. But the reality of the deadly virus changed her mind. I decided to get it because I saw my daughter-in-law's father got so sick and he passed away. And then I thought, hey, let me also get it. I take a flu vaccine every year. I go and they buy it and they give it to me. And then I thought, no, let me do this also. With South Africa's COVID death toll surpassing 79,000, volunteers like this paramedic are scrambling to quell people's vaccine fears. The country's Muslim Association launched an at-home vaccination program to provide individual attention to allay concerns and to remove the barriers of traveling to a clinic. And I think it's just a misconception, people reading on social media, people hearing from different people, um, that is bad for you, that is man-made. How can we create a vaccine in a year, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of uh, hesitancy that we've come across, but we put their, their fears to bed. South Africa's vaccine rollout has faced hurdles providing the vaccine, but experts say the more recent lag in inoculating the country's 59 million people is the result of misinformation fueled by social media, along with more practical concerns. One is very worried about the social media rumors. Broadly, the concerns about vaccines seem to be a bit more reasonable. And in our survey, for instance, it was shown that mostly individuals were worried about 
safety and they were mostly worried about um, the turnaround time for developing the vaccine. Another problem is access to transportation and basic information, especially among the elderly. The registration for vaccines are electronic. And even though you can at sites also register, you need to know where the sites are uh, before you can show up there. For people like 22-year-old Kurt Fisher, who is quadriplegic, getting to a vaccination site is difficult both physically and mentally, says his father. The rest of the Fisher family has been vaccinated. I would have sacrificed not having it to give him my shot, if possible, that he's, he's first. The familiarity of being able to be in his house is a big benefit, that there's no stress involved going to a foreign, uh, foreign venue. Experts say volunteer efforts are closing the gap in vaccinating more people, especially the most vulnerable. President Cyril Ramaphosa applauded the country's youth on Monday for rushing to sites as vaccines were made available to those as young as 18. But experts warn that fears and other barriers still need to be addressed, or the latest uptick could fizzle out as it did among older age groups. Linda Giftash for VOA News, Johannesburg. The spike in COVID-19 cases in the U.S. is prompting the European Union to recommend restrictions on non-essential travel by Americans. In the meantime, EU countries recently passed the U.S. in rates of vaccinations due to strict rules like vaccine passports and contact tracing. Once criticized for delays in vaccinations, the EU is now providing help to its most vulnerable citizens. More from our Henry Ridgewell in London. A handful of gummy bears and a certificate. The rewards for these children receiving their coronavirus vaccinations in Germany. It is one of several European countries to begin vaccinating children. Many will begin rolling out booster shots for older age groups in the coming weeks. The catch-up process has been very successful, but we need to keep up the effort. The European Union purchased vaccines for all member states. At first, it faced criticism for delays in approval and delivery. Now, member states praise its efforts. Spain and Portugal are now in the global top five for percentage of the population fully vaccinated. The country success, a success for all of us, has to do firstly with the European Union's advanced purchase strategy. The surge in vaccination rates is also being driven by strict national rules. Over a dozen EU states have introduced some form of COVID-19 digital pass, which shows whether you've been vaccinated, received a recent negative test or have recently recovered from the disease. Those without the pass are unable to enter bars, restaurants and many public places. Of course, there will always be a certain group in society which is not going to get vaccinated, which is opposed to getting vaccinated. Um, but those who are a bit more reluctant, um, those who are on the edge, uh, can be pushed in that direction um, if there are consequences. France has among the strictest COVID-19 pass rules in Europe. Seine-Saint-Denis, north of Paris, is the poorest region of mainland France and suffered the highest COVID-19 death rate in the country at the start of the year. But the region is now well above the national average for vaccine take-up. The local mayor says the COVID-19 pass is responsible. When the measures were announced by the president, we saw a huge increase in vaccinations. In Italy, too, strict rules requiring a so-called COVID green pass to enter bars and restaurants have prompted a surge in vaccinations. 
I think it's right to protect those who have been vaccinated so they don't end up locked up again. Not all approve. Thousands took to the streets of Riga, Latvia this month, protesting against COVID-19 pass rules. There have been similar protests in France, Spain and Italy. Meanwhile, critics say that Europe is falling behind the United States and China in the number of coronavirus vaccine doses donated to poorer countries and is given just a fraction of the 200 million doses pledged by the end of 2021. The World Health Organization has recommended that vaccinations be distributed to less developed nations before third booster shots are given in richer countries. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. First of all, we have, as I mentioned in my remarks, um, strict and, and uh, detailed guidance as to how to keep our children safe in school. Um, this includes vaccination of everybody who is eligible, wearing masks in school, um, and we are seeing in some school, as well as uh, um, distancing screening protocols, we are seeing schools that are not following these guidance, specifically not masking, not having, having lower rates of vaccination, are uh, dealing with outbreaks, especially in the context of this um, very transmissible Delta variant. Um, and we are encouraging those schools to follow our guidance um, and, and uh, to follow our assistance as they manage those outbreaks to get their kids safely back into school. With regard to uh, pediatric hospitalizations, um, we know that there's an absolute number of children, that because of this highly transmissible variant, an absolute number of children that are infected now with, um, with SARS-CoV-2. And because of that absolute number, there's a, a larger number of uh, children in the hospital. We're also um, simultaneously dealing with an RSV outbreak that is occurring in children now that's atypical for this season, but is also leading to um, more occupancy of those pediatric hospital beds. And as our medical experts laid out, having reviewed all the available data, it is in their clinical judgment uh, that it is time to prepare Americans for a booster shot. We announced our approach in order to stay ahead of the virus, give states and pharmacies time to plan, and to be transparent with the American people as to the latest data and expert clinical judgments from the team to give them time to do their own planning we have been also been very clear throughout that this is pending FDA conducting an independent evaluation and CDC's panel of outside experts issuing a booster dose recommendation. So the bottom line, this virus has proven to be unpredictable and we want to stay ahead of it and plan for every scenario. And that's been our approach from day one and will continue to be our approach. I would like to appeal to this country, to the people in the country who are not vaccinated to realize that we have the capability among ourselves to essentially cut down the time frame to getting the end of this pandemic very, very clearly by just listening to everything you've heard on this press conference. Get vaccinated and the time frame will be truncated dr dramatically.
Rescue efforts are underway in the southeastern U.S. state of Louisiana, where a powerful Category 4 hurricane destroyed homes and left more than one million people without power this week. Storm damage is also impacting frontline workers who are struggling to handle a surge of COVID-19 cases among unvaccinated patients in the region. The two crises are taxing an already overburdened health care system. Earlier, I spoke with reporter Matt Haynes in New Orleans for the latest developments on the ground. I'm in the New Orleans area where I was before I evacuated. And uh, my understanding is that the um, uh, generators were able to keep the hospitals there um, pretty well powered. And I know some of the, uh, like just west of New Orleans in Kenner, uh, a hospital there, for example, I heard, I've heard stories of doctors who had to kind of like hand ventilate uh, patients uh, who were in a critical condition because of COVID. Uh, so yeah, there are some stories of that. Uh, but um, it seems like uh, now uh, the Energy is the energy company in the area. Uh, seems to have those uh, the hospitals. I mean, obviously the hospitals are a big thing. What uh, is the va unvaccinated population compared to the vaccinated population in that area? Um, are there a lot of people who are hesitant? Is that why the numbers at the hospital uh, have been higher and? Um, and is there a certain demographic that that tends to happen because and does that correspond with those who are hardest hit during a natural disaster like the hurricane because in the past it's the underserved that gets hit the hardest um, during a hurricane. Can you talk about that and whether there's a connection there? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, things have definitely changed recently with the Delta variant. Um, I think uh, that uh, people maybe some people who were previously hesitant uh, especially around the New Orleans, and I guess really that's an important place to start, is that it's kind of a tale of two places. There's New Orleans, um, which there's much less hesitancy uh, in the city. I believe New Orleans right now has 80% of its population with at least one uh, dose of, of, of one of the vaccines uh, versus Louisiana as a whole, uh, which is even with New Orleans, the most populous city at, at 80%, the, the state is still at just barely, just about to get to 50%. Um, and so, you know, I think it's uh, unfortunately things have become so politicized and uh, you tend to have more conservative voters outside of the city. And I think that's uh, um, that also happens to be this time where a lot of the, uh, the, the biggest damage happened to be uh, because of the storm. Is there any word or uh, an estimate as to how soon things could get back to normal again with power restored and and uh, so at least the hospitals would be able to uh, be back to normal? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's hard to tell right now what are rumors versus what are like official statements. Um, but I think uh, the consistent numbers seem to be, for example, in um, Jefferson Parish, which is one parish to the west of Orleans Parish where New Orleans is, um, they uh, released a statement saying that um, so city, or. Uh, uh, parish officials released a statement saying in Jefferson Parish they expect that 90% of the parish should have electricity again in three weeks. Um, so they think a lot of people will get it before then, but that's when they feel comfortable saying 90% of the of the parish will have it. And that is a very big parish. It goes all the way down south to where um, the hurricane made landfall in Grand Isle, for example, where um, you know, that's a, a much more vulnerable vulnerable area. Thank you, Matt Haynes, for bringing that report, and please stay safe. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. We're keeping an eye on the events in Afghanistan and the departure of the U.S. military. With Kabul under Taliban control, hundreds of journalists, many of them women, are seeking sanctuary. VOA's Isha Sarai tells us more in this week's Press Freedom Spotlight. Barely a month ago, Storai Karimi and her husband were reporting from the front lines of Herat, Today, they are hiding in Pakistan, having fled Taliban rule. Taliban 
international media organizations say getting their Afghan colleagues to safety has been a difficult task. The International Women's Media Foundation says the press freedom community is fielding thousands of requests. This is certainly in the time that we've been doing emergency assistance, the biggest, most complicated, um, most difficult um, operation to try to support uh, journalists who are in immediate danger uh, of losing their lives that we've ever been involved with. Even those who manage to flee say their lives are still in danger. As journalists try to find safe passage out of Afghanistan or go into hiding for their own safety, many fear an impending blackout of information across the country. It's a really terrible conundrum, right? Um, which is that if the journalists leave Afghanistan, then nobody knows what's happening inside. But if they don't leave, um, they may not be left alive to actually do their reporting. With U.S. and NATO troops gone, the concern turns to those left behind. Isha Sarai, VOA News. The coronavirus pandemic is again threatening to disrupt school for millions of students and teachers worldwide. For those studying the sciences, they are losing critical time in the laboratory as well as the classroom. At the University of Johannesburg, they are trying to bring the lab to the students through virtual reality. Linda Givtash has more. It may look like fun and games, but these South African students are deepening their knowledge of science. The virtual reality hub at the University of Johannesburg's Faculty of Education helps students get up close to atoms, cells, and viruses. Students are learning in a more interactive way, in a more immersive way. It's more engaging in that they are able to visualize micro-scientific phenomena. And you can actually repeat that over and over. Um, it is one of the greatest benefits of learning in this way. Even before the pandemic made South Africa the continent's hotspot, students' laboratory time was limited. But not in the virtual world. The university developed a VR headset inspired by the Google Cardboard that costs less than $20 and works with any smartphone. I can use what I've been provided with at the comfort of my couch at home. So you can just go to YouTube, you can u use your, your device, your smartphone, if it's compatible with the apps, and then you can actually uh, uh, view, view cells, or whatever uh, a science concept that you are studying at that, that moment. VR isn't just helping these students study STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. It's also gearing up this next generation of teachers to use technology to boost STEM in poor primary and secondary schools. Especially learners who come from a very much impoverished background where schools are in disadvantaged communities where they don't have fully fitted laboratories. And uh, unfortunately, because of those uh, learning experiences that they have in, in STEM education, it has not inspired uh, learners at school to pursue tertiary studies. The shortfalls became apparent when the pandemic lockdown sent students home. Schools scrambled to adopt distance learning technology. But as students return to the classroom, educators say the pandemic's changes to learning will stick around. The future of learning is actually blended learning or hybrid learning, whereby we are going to blend face-to-face -face interaction. So students, there will be dedicated sessions whereby students will attend class. But that is going to be blended now with virtual online learning. So I do not believe that we're going to go back to as we were. The University of Johannesburg is working with South Africa's education ministry to bring VR devices to public schools. If the program proves successful, they hope to replicate it across the country and around the continent. Linda Giftash for VOA News, Johannesburg. That's it for now. Get the latest information on the coronavirus at voanews.com and stay connected at VOA News on Instagram and Facebook. Follow me on Twitter at EliTV1. I am Elizabeth Lee reporting from Washington, D.C. See you next week for the Inside Story.